Hello, global audience. Welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are short conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. So we're gonna have 20 minutes of shop talk, tech talk, learning as much as we can from our amazing guest, and then 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys, the global audience. Press the Q&A button and ask your questions. This is a rare chance to be with a, a, a global visionary. Um, by the way, I'm Liz Hinline. I am creative director and filmmaker at the New York Film Academy. And today I'm so pleased to present Thomas Werner, who is an acclaimed author, He's a photographer, he's a speaker, and well-known grant writer, and many other titles that are just amazing, and it has a really deep, lush career. So hello, Thomas. Greetings. Oh, yay, you're there. Hey, Look at that. We did it. How exciting. It is. Um, Thanks for having me. Thank you, and NIFA, and 2020. Thank you. So as I said before, we want to jump, let's just jump into the big kahuna is sure. you have a knowledge base and a really successful track record in grant writing. And if, I would love to hear like what you've written grants for, and then we can dive into like, what is the magic, you know, ingredients that, that you found really works it. And I guess the first um, objective for artists, whether they're fine artists or filmmakers, why grants? Okay. Well, I'll do why grants and give you a couple examples. Why grants? because they're an amazing way to fund your projects and your goal to raise your visibility and advance your career. And I think a lot of artists misunderstand grants or look at them singularly and miss a lot of opportunities. Uh, I've, I've been lucky. I've successfully written 18 grants over the last 16 years um, uh, for the Moscow Youth Biennale. I took four artists in the Moscow Youth Biennale. I've done numerous projects with the US Department of State. I've worked with uh, Trust for Mutual Understanding uh, done a film workshop in Kyrgyzstan, uh, seven year uh, collaborative, curatorial collaborative with the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. So a number of things. Uh, it's been a blast. And none of that, I shouldn't say none of it, but a lot of it wouldn't have been successful without grants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and so like, were you writing, sorry, the, <laughs> this okay. is a crazy office that the light goes on and off. Um, <laughs> and trying to turn it on. Were you writing specifically, did you have a concept in mind and said, okay, I need to find some funding for this? Or were you like, oh, that's a, I would like to go to Kazakhstan. Like, let me write something for that. <laughs> well, I think I've, I've approached grants in, in different ways. So yes, there are things that, places I wanted to go or projects that I wanted to do that I've looked for grant funding for. Uh, what I found is that very quickly you become known within the niche in which you write your grants and you do your work. So initially, nobody knew who I was, quite frankly. And then as you begin to write more and deliver, you have greater opportunities. I think if you're a young grant writer or a starting grant writer, the idea is, of, is where I began was success begets success. So if you start with a small grant and prove that you can deliver on time, on budget, and I always over deliver, I always give a little bit more than I promised, it'll make you more viable when you apply for larger grants. So I started out with a couple of two, three, four thousand dollar grants that allowed me to go overseas and work with the Department of State in some regional parts of Russia. And then that led to funding through other foundations. So um, do you find when you're reading these grants on wherever you're finding these grants and you're reading all their sort of requirements and all that, have you been successful because you stuck exactly to the rules or were you more like maverick and and <laughs> broadened it out so they got works wow this guy's really thinking out of the box <laughs> well I, there, there are two answers to that one is you have to follow all the guidelines specifically if they want no more than 350 words you don't so if you give them a 400 word description and a 350 word ask you're out a friend of mine used to be the former director of the foundation of the bank of america and those were some of the ways that they sifted through grant funding people who simply didn't follow the basic instructions now Outside of that, yes, there are two ways you need to be outside the box. One is in terms of the grants that you look for. So a lot of artists will look for a grant to fund an exhibition, to make a film, or to do something like that. I want to do this project, so I want money for it. And there is some, mm -hmm. but there isn't a lot. 
But if you begin to look at it a little differently, there's a lot of funding. And the example I like to use is, let's say I want to do photographs in a film in the Amazon basin. I want to go, I want to travel the Amazon basin and I want to do a film there. Why not? Right. It'd be amazing. Cool. Right. But nobody's going to pay me to go do that, sadly. Uh, so, but if I decide to do a project on the effects of climate change on indigenous tribes in the Amazon basin, all of a sudden, if I'm working in service of that idea, if mm -hmm. that's the foundation's mission, you always have to work towards the foundation's mission. That's the other key to writing a successful grant. It isn't about me, it's about them and what they want to do. So if I want to go to the Amazon and do it on climate change and indigenous tribes, I can get funding to go to the Amazon, to do the photos, to do the videos, to hire a guide, to have a translator. And then I have can generally get funding to bring it back, edit it, exhibit it, and show the film because that's dissemination, which is another important part of a grant. So that it's is genius. So, so you're sort of, so it's almost, it is like treating, this is how I hear it coming from also a commercial director background is you're treating the grants like clients. Yes. Because it's oh, about yes. them and what their vision is not about me and my artistic artiste, like <laughs> project that I really want to do and you to fund my genius. Exactly. And that's, I think, why a large number of artists become frustrated or write a large mm -hmm. number of grants to receive a couple because they aren't servicing that larger social concept or their client. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes so. total sense. And what, aside from that, have you found like there's there's some continue, like now you must, are you like a machine? Oh, here comes the grant and I'll just <laughs> plug it in. Um, is, is there some other, because that's a great, knowledge base to, to understand the, the approach. Is there something also in, in what, say you haven't, you want to do photographs, but you've never shot anything or like, you know, you don't have it on your reel to actually say you could deliver on it. How do you approach that? Well, if it's something like that, that you don't have evidence, it's always good to have evidence of what you can do. If you don't have evidence, then you start small and you get somebody to fund a concept or you, you fund their concept. There was a a group that was doing microfinance in uh, Mexico and South America, and they needed somebody to do the project. They would have been a perfect person for somebody with less, uh, less evidence of their ability to perhaps to, to ask than mm -hmm. wanting to work with the Department of State, you know, and being a cultural representative, you know, the, so you look for smaller things to evidence, you need to create evidence of your ability to do things. The other thing uh, for a successful grant, there are two other things I'd throw in before we get too far in is adding a free educational component, either mm. where you're working or in your home country or both mm -hmm. always is always useful because you're sharing knowledge gained, you're providing a service to the community and you're giving visibility to your funder and giving visibility to your funder to help them achieve their mission is essential, right? Wow. So the ability to disseminate your work or create public events, a website, social media, the ability to attract press will all help you receive funding from a lot of organizations. That yeah. is very clever. So, so you're sort of you're, you're sort of working the the thing. It's it's not just filling out the the no, boxes. You have to be. It's like anything else. You have to be an attractive partner. So having great partners within a country. So if I can write a grant in Russia and say I, I the Hermitage Museum will come on as a partner, or Right. a regional government or something it makes me more attractive there or here you know you look for other partners if i can say like after i'd been to russia a few times i could say for each talk i can draw between 100 and 350 people per talk i can guarantee two tv stations a radio or a radio interview or a couple of newspapers at each city so i had evidence of that and then mm -hmm. that immediately makes you more grant fundable, right? Because they want people in that region to know the good things that they're doing. That's amazing. I'm gonna just cut in because I we usually wait for questions, but Kevin has a very apt question. Where do you find these grants or where are you sourcing them? So there's the Foundation Center, which is located in New York, but you can look it up online. And they are the largest resource of funding and foundations. Uh, I also, a lot of it's just researching uh, grants in your field of study. So once you begin to, I never imagined working in Russia, but it happened. And then all of mm -hmm. a sudden I got a grant and then I, a, a small grant funder reached out to me and said, will you write a letter of reference for us? 
to this large foundation to get funding because you're a, what do they say? You're an expert in provincial Russia, which I didn't realize I was. So, <laughs> but I'd been working there. So I wrote them a letter and then they were, they were friendly. And then, so you begin to reach out within your area of interest. Uh, there are also grants focused specifically on people from different countries, different backgrounds, different mm -hmm. parts of the city, right? If you're gonna do something in New York, there's Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, every borough has grants. So don't just look at the, the artist grants, but begin to look at, look at things that apply to you and certainly that look apply to your project. Interesting, and we've talked about this before, Thompson. I thought this was genius. Is not just to look, and I always want to underline that for people, not just to look at artist grants. Yes. It's like grant can be for something. You happen to use your art form, but so that will make you more unique. Yes. To people that are writing for that grant, because not everybody's a filmmaker, not everybody's a photographer who's doing that grant. Oh, completely right. My ability to either photograph or create a video. I did a twenty-city video project in Russia. We did. We had courses in 20 cities across the country for the State Department over two years, over two summers. And nobody else was bringing that to the table. But the fact that right. I could made me more valuable. Now, I, I use the State Department because that's something I did. They're a very specific client, but I've also done similar projects for foundations. So yes, what you do as an artist has a lot of value in terms of creativity, connecting with community and dissemination. But you need to state that. You can, and you can't just state I'll get press. You can't just state, I'll make sure people see it. You need to explain how and why. Mm. Yeah. And also, you know, it's interesting because let's say coming from filmmakers backers, we're all very myopic into the Hollywood or into the industry. So there's the, the funders from the studios or for production companies or for whatever it is or private financing. But we don't see sometimes that our toolkit is like an actually an asset to people who are not in our little myopic oh. industry. Definitely. And look, the work that you do for a foundation or the work that you do in South America gives you more credibility in Hollywood. Or I can't tell you how many friends say, you know, someone at Netflix, because I have this great documentary. Well, mm -hmm. if you've created a documentary for a foundation, maybe it isn't the full documentary that you want to take and that Netflix might buy, but it might be enough to evidence for them your ability to do it, right? So everything is about the next project. I think we frequently think about projects as this grant or this film or this, but I use the analogy of surfing. When you're riding a wave, the wave always ends. It always crashes. And you always need to be looking for the next wave. So whatever project you do, you should be looking for the next project. If you can grant fund a small film somewhere, even in the US, that gets you something abroad. That gives you credibility in New York and Hollywood, if you do it well. That is so interesting and, and very apt. So I'm just going to, I want to cut to another thing, which I'm so curious about is, so you, how, what, what has your experience working in Russia been? And has, did that change over time for you? <laughs> My experience in Russia was extraordinary, uh, challenging, rewarding. It was an amazing adventure. It was a little difficult, a little dangerous. And I also worked with some of the most creative people I've ever met. The Russians are fearless in terms of creativity. Uh, their production is last minute and chaotic and stress filled. And you need to know that well, you learn that very quickly and having a great translator of your own and on your team is essential. Uh, that was a lesson well learned early on anywhere in the world. You need your own person to, to problem well, solve. It's funny because I uh, we were talking about how I've worked globally and, you're and, it's, and it's a very funny detail that your translator, because if your translator is translating from their team, you have really no idea what they're saying. Exactly. And they could tell you anything about anything, honestly. <laughs> like, oh, they said they love the shot. Yeah. You know, or, or they hate oh. the shot. Or they, you know, yeah. and you have no idea to, you have no, especially with like China or Russia or anything that's oh, yeah. to really fact check and not be there with your translator app for like an hour trying to figure out what people are doing. Yeah. They can say anything. Well, sorry, we can't get this shot. I've had it or whatever. A translator will lean over and say, either they didn't say that or don't worry, we can do this. I know someone. I mean, they're just the best, <laughs> best people. They are my favorite people in many ways, uh, particularly when you're out in the middle of nowhere. We assume a lot of resources and those resources don't exist in many places in the world. But uh, Russia was great. I, I was very naive, which has been a key to a large part of my career as has been trying things that I really didn't know what the end result would be. So very quickly, I took a trip to Russia and then Romania. I wanted to drive Romania. Mm. It was far too dangerous and the people at the hotel begged me not to at that time. 
So I came back and I met a guy on a train platform in Philadelphia after an ASMP board meeting with a bag, it said US Embassy Moscow, and I asked him if he would, uh, if he had any insight into how I could do a project, a lecture, or something in Russia. Mm -hmm. And he gave me his card and he said, send a proposal. And I did, and I did a little background check and he gave me two email addresses and I very naively got all dressed up with my American CV and got on a plane to Moscow. My God. And, and that like, was on your own dime? Wait, let me say, so you- Yeah, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, the early Russian work was all on my own dime. It, I didn't have any evidence. It was the only way that I was gonna make it happen. And it just seemed like a great adventure, you know? Uh, if I, it, it was, but I had no idea what I was in for. Wow. And the kindness of strangers, really. I got to Moscow, I spoke very little Russian. And at that point, not a lot of people spoke English. And mm -hmm. I would just ask strangers, you know, they gave me two email addresses, one in Moscow, one in St. Petersburg. And the woman in Moscow connected me with the head of the uh, uh, Russian National Center for Contemporary Art in Russia and, wow. and Soviet gentleman. And I met with him and he looked like an alien and he really looked at me like an alien had beamed in. And he gave me the name. He said, oh, I have this friend, Mr. Bajanov, Yosef Bajanov, he's starting, uh, or, uh, Bajanov is the point I met with, uh, Yosef Bakstein. He's starting the Moscow, some Biennale thing. You should meet with him. <laughs> so I met with him at the, very long story short, I met with him at the Lenin Museum and he leaned over and he's asking me and he said, my friends, they laugh at me for this Biennale. You will come speak at my Biennale at Bajanov's museum. They will laugh at us no more. And he, you know, he started the Moscow Biennale. And wow. I went and I failed epically because I didn't understand Russia, the customs or the knowledge base. And then I went to St. Petersburg and that changed my life actually. It, uh, that's how I ended up working with state and uh, working with the Hermitage. And they took me to provincial Russia and it, it really was life-changing. I, I can't say enough for the people who did that. And, yeah. and just, just before we end that part, like, so in life-changing, what did you see or what are there some things that you saw or experienced that really sort of did a click for you? Well, yeah, they, there are a couple of things. My first talk at the Hermitage came about because they were having their very first contemporary art exhibition and Chuck Close was speaking and another gentleman and the third gentleman couldn't get a visa. And I just happened to walk in with this Mary Ellen Countryman from the U.S. Department of State. And she said to Sophia, who was running it, Sophia, I mean, Sophia said, Mary Ellen, so-and-so can't come. And Mary Ellen said, well, Sophia, why don't you have Thomas speak? And she, she was two feet away. She looked at me and went, oh, Mary Ellen, I don't know. And, like I'm right here. <laughs> and uh, Mary Ellen said, no, let him do it. So I spoke they had about 150 people, spoke the next day, we, or two days later, we had sitting room. And I gave people an assignment and eight people brought it. And then after the eight, I said, sorry, we're done. About 40 more people came up because they were worried they were gonna get critiqued and ridiculed by this person mm. from New York. And mm -hmm. we critiqued for six and a half hours. And at the end of that, one girl, we're still friends, came up and she said, I just wanna thank you, you give us hope. And I mm. thought, where else in your life can you do that? You know. And I promised myself that I would go back as often as I could. Uh, what else did I learn? I learned that there are a lot of people with a lot less who work a lot harder and appreciate everything a lot more. Uh, particularly mm. than we do at university. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a, a great love of craft. And um, I met some extraordinary Soviet people who are some of the kindest in the world, dispelling a lot of mythology. And, and uh, I learned too, that if you go back, people appreciate it even more. So I know a lot of people who go once, but if you go a second time, people are shocked. Wow. Because mm -hmm. you go to help. So yeah, it's, uh, it was, it was life-changing. I saw and experienced things, yeah, you would never see. I got to visit Crimea right after it was taken over or annexed or whatever word people mm -hmm. are using. Yeah, yeah, extraordinary times. I wouldn't trade wow. it. Wow. Um, cut to, I have another, so because you had such a fantastic and various and interesting career, my question is, is like, what was it like to run a, a art gallery in New York City? Nah, it was completely indulgent. Um, it was a lot of work. I started the gallery because I had a photo studio in Chelsea and a 9-11, everything ended. I had a job mm -hmm. for Carassier and I put up some friends' work and people came in. I co-curator, assistant curated the, uh, home, the top six floors in the Helmsley building, the Swiss Re collection. So I knew some people in the city. I thought, well, why not do it? 
So I went to a friend who was a director of Paul Kasman at the time. And I said, I'm going to open an art gallery. And she said, you can't do that. You don't have an art history degree. You've never run a gallery. You've never worked at one. And I said, it's open. So <laughs> it was open. And uh, it's a lot of work. I learned a lot about the need to be consistent, a lot about audience, a lot about perception, a lot about market. Um, I was also an exhibiting artist at the time. I was represented by a gallery in New York and LA and uh, was reviewed in the New Yorker, which was the peak of my artistic career. Mm. And it would never get any better for me. And I was content forever with that uh, and didn't pursue that. But being a gallerist was amazing. You get to help people in their careers. You get to work in art. Walking into the gallery every day was magic. It was just magic. Uh, but I, I would say art fairs changed everything. And once you had to spend a lot of money and go to a high pressure art fair and try to sell a certain amount, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't gallery based for me, the, the joy went away, really. I, don't, I wouldn't run a gallery in the same way uh, again. And what did you find about, because I imagine starting a gallery in the sort of intense art market of New York City is like pretty much like ju jumping off the diving board. <laughs> what did you find about the, the, the well, I love what you were starting to talk about the perception, like how did you create perception or did you have a perception in mind and how did you even get it into like people's minds to come to this gallery? Well, it it was a number of things. I'd, I'd been working as a photographer for years. So I, I borrowed from that brand identity and transferred part of it to the gallery. So we had a consistent visibility. Mm -hmm. um, I, you learn very quickly to choose your artists for any number of reasons. You have to choose your artists for your clientele, not just choose the people you think are cool, which I did the first few months and thought was great, but it's a disaster. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's, it's marketing and promotion. We took out ads. Uh, as a gallerist, you have to be everywhere. So you do breakfast, lunch, dinners, events, People expect you, your whole life becomes about that gallery. And it was another reason I was glad to step away because I got to the point where I either needed to up my game and go to the first floor or, mm -hmm. you know, and do more fairs or, or I thought stop. And I think I had a lot of other things happening. I was a, teaching full-time at Parsons. I'd been the director of the photo program. I was working in Russia and it just was a lot. So uh, yeah, it was time. It, it was sad, but it was time. That's, but that's super helpful for, you know, just to be able to run that type of business. Well, it's a business. Really, it's a business, putting it together with your love of art. I think what most people didn't understand, the galleries that I saw come and fail quickly during my time, mm -hmm. was that they immediately wanted to be in Art in America and have huge ads and overspend. And I will say this for grant writing, or look, I, I mentioned these when we were talking. I think the world is flat. It's equally easy to produce a project in... France or Russia or South America mm -hmm. as it is to do in New York or the Midwest and Wisconsin. You need, I think you need a lean team. You need to manage your budget and not overspend. You need to be really focused and driven in terms of your objective. And I think a lot of people, certainly in the gallery business came in with big dreams and big budgets and spent themselves out of the game quickly. And I made a deal with myself that I would run the gallery as long as it made money and it was a business. So it had to be, I mean, as much right. as it was a love, it had to be a business. And, and um, I think the same thing goes for a lot of what we do. If you, if you manage down your expenses and manage your time, it gives you the ability to multitask, not multitask, I hate that phrase, but to do a lot of, a lot of different things, projects and play. I think this conduit's in, so this is sort of an essential question is about creating a brand as an artist. So you talked about with your gallery that you had a certain clientele and you wanted to play that clientele. So if you're an artist, do you want to play to a clientele or do you want to create your brand and have them come to you? Well, I think, well, um, people, artists have to market. I mean, it's inevitable. So you have to be on Instagram, whether you like it or not. And, you know, it isn't about capitalism or not. It's just nobody knows that you're making great art if they can't see it. You have to do Correct. open studios. You have to send mailers. Uh, as a gallery, we did work on paper, not solely photography. And we did things that were really brightly colored or very minimal. So we had a, a consistent visual base. Mm -hmm. And I think an artist has to do the same thing. You have to build on a concept consistently to build a career. It isn't just about making some work and then making more work. And it's about producing and delivering in the same way. Not that Jeannie Greenberg, I was on panel with Jeannie Greenberg and Kathy Ryan and a bunch of other people at, at uh, New NYU. And Jeannie said, 
great artists explore a very narrow vision broadly. Interesting. That's and a I great thought, quote. It isn't it? Yeah. And she, it was so right on. So if I, in photography, I think of Richard Avedon, Irving Penn, or mm -hmm. I don't, David LaChapelle, or you know, all of those people explored, you know who they are because you look at their work and you understand it. They aren't making the same work, but they have a personal vision conceptually and visually, intellectually. It's kind of who they are. So if you can manifest that as an artist and people understand your identity, same thing as a filmmaker, right? It isn't just mm -hmm. photography, it's filmmaking, it's writing. When I write, I have to have a certain style. I do have a certain style. Um, and I think you need to do that. So that's what it's about uh, being an artist. And then you do have to get out. You have to let people know you're there. And that's was my least favorite thing. I like social media because I don't send, I hate sending an email saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. But if you come to my Instagram or my Facebook or wherever else I'm on, you're saying, I want to see what you're doing. And if you don't want to see it, you can leave. So I feel much more comfortable posting something like this talk on my Instagram right. because people choose to be there. That I'm comfortable with. So marketing as an artist, if you want to create a separate Instagram or social media account, I think it makes sense. It, it, uh, and I would separate it to a certain extent from your personal life. Mm, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, 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 but sometimes there is also a school of people want to see you as a human, like well, as a three-dimensional human. You do build that in, right? You have mm -hmm. to include pictures of yourself, not just of your work. Right. Right. So you do build other things in. I mean, they're, they're things from my personal life and my Instagram, but not, I don't think there are any, unless we're out at an event, I don't think there are any pictures of like me hanging out with my friends on right. the weekend, but there might be <laughs> where we're hanging out, which is different. hundred percent where, you know, the style of where you're going. Let me, uh, Cece asked, do you need a profile to get a grant, especially when you are starting and when you're not a brand yet? No, you can get a grant when you don't have a, a brand. What you need to do is be really defined in your proposal. So when you write a grant proposal, you'll ask to state your idea, which should address the mission of the founder. And then you do a description, which should be a step-by-step -step description of how you're going to make that proposal happen. And then, well, depending on the grant, there are a series of other things. You'll ask for a budget, and you really need to do a budget that you can meet um, to to suggestions in terms of budget. One is budget ahead because the grant will be funded probably a few months from now, maybe six months from now. So I always look at airfares and hotels six months out and then bump mm. them up slightly. Because once you get a mm -hmm. grant, you can't go ask, go back and ask for more money. You need to deliver what you promised on their budget. It's your response. And I've eaten it. I mean, I've learned because I've had to go out of pocket. The other thing right. that I learned was grants are income. So you need to show expenses against income. I got a grant, a huge grant in Russia at, I don't know, it was like at the end of November, but there was no way I was going to be able to spend it. I had to pay taxes right. on that and then meet the grant. So I lost the tax money and I had to make that up out of my own pocket. It was just a, a beginner's mistake. So be aware of when you get funded and make sure that you spend an expense with receipts every bit of that grant. Yep. And it, that is an interesting, yeah, because someone's going to get, it's, as I said, no free lunch, right? There is no free lunch. And <laughs> it is, it is free money, but, it, but it's not just like, and, and there you go. Yeah. Making your work and seeing the world on, you know, through grant funding is great, but yeah, there are also the other question that comes up is, well, if I'm going to work on this sculpture for three months, can I get, the grant, it's going to cost me 15000 to make a sculpture. Can I get $15,000 to live on while I make it? And the answer is no. They're not going to give you fifteen grand to live on and pay all your expenses while you make the, make the mm -hmm. piece. So they'll probably pay you to make the piece and they'll, they'll fund everything. And then if you go to install it, they'll pay you a per diem, a daily rate, you know, to eat and live. And then they'll pay for your travel to do the installation. And maybe they'll give you an honorarium to do talks. But... Uh, no, they generally grants don't provide living income. Generally, they're but, a couple. But but Thomas, you just also pulled there's there's many little threads that we can add to the budget. On yeah. our air talks, you know, installation fees, uh, travel, uh, travel to the site to check it out. I have to oh, stay somewhere when I go there. Completely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We did a 
project in Russia for the Contemporary Art and Historical Museums. Four of us went over, I went over a couple days early, four artists joined me. We photographed all these small museums around St. Petersburg, like Lenin's old apartment, like all these amazing wow. old museums. And then they came back and then I flew out to check the space and then to do the installation and then do talks. So yeah, it turned out to be two 10, 12 day trips. It was amazing. Yeah, that's, that's the gift. And then the other thing I'll say is when you get a grant, I always layer other things on top. So when I'm travel, when I was traveling on Russia, I would interview historical Russian photographers or I collected mm -hmm. historical Russian photography. I have probably the largest or second largest collection in the country. And you just, you know, you find other ways to do other things. So if I want to go somewhere, it'd be great. I also went out. I mean, I hung out with friends, but for me, it was about how can I maximize this time mm. and build other projects on top of it? Because I'm not going to fly to Murmansk or, you know, Omsk, you know, how many times in your life. So while you're there, enjoy it, but also. Right. Right. Do? Yeah. hundred um, percent. Back to the artist question. Kevin asks, as an artist, did you find it hard to create work for the gallery that you would sell? Uh, yeah. That would sell and creating work, otherwise creating work for yourself. <laughs> well, I the work that I created, they were able to sell, so that's why they that's why they brought me on board to begin with. But yes, mm -hmm. I found it difficult, and I have friends who have been far more successful who, at times, <laughs> find it difficult to make art for their gallery. So they wanted more of the work that I was making because it sold. Right. And at a certain point, they would say, "We have an upcoming exhibition. We would like X number of pieces," and I had, art had also been really indulgent and selfish for me. So it was really hard for me. Um, I'll be completely frank, it, that and um, working commercially and teaching to a certain extent because uh, our school became increasingly theory-based, took away some mm -hmm. of the joy of making. And I really had to step back. So it's one of the reasons uh, I didn't continue as an exhibiting artist because I'm really selfish about my work. And well, I, I don't think that's a, I think maybe selfishness needs a bad connotation. Maybe it, it seems like you, you have things you want to make and you don't want to just be under like the high, the gun of, no, keep making the same thing that's selling. No, but, but they're trades. Everything's a trade, right. right? I didn't get angry at my gallerist. I produced what they wanted, right? I produced for my clients. I produced for the university. I produced for mm -hmm. the grant funders. I have no problem with that. The minute you choose not to, you choose not to. So you can't get mad at the gallery because you're not making, they're not exhibiting the work uh, that you just want to make, right? You can't right. be brought on board to make X and then all of a sudden make something different and get angry because they're not showing it or selling it. That's a business too. And we might not want to believe so. And it's not being cruel to an artist. Nobody's trying to stifle your creativity. Uh, it's just, it's just fair. So Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. Is it challenging? Yes. Um, but, you know, every, probably every artist who's had a career has faced that. I mean, there are stories of Picasso being asked to paint X number of paintings, or, you know, I have friends who are photographers who have done very, very well, and they've been asked to make more. So I love, it make, reminds me of, of uh, Hannah and her sisters when, when the painters, <laughs> like, I don't make things by the foot. I don't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the wealthy guys like I needed to fit this wall space. I don't really it's like I don't care what it looks like, but it needs to fit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but you know, but that, that is I think it's 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 you know, it goes back to our brand conversation because you're you create a you know, luckily enough, you if one creates a brand that actually attracts people that want to pay you money for your brand. Right, right. It is sort of like changing lanes a little bit it's like it's like a band suddenly singing in a whole new you know right. paradigm and and some people love that and say oh that's so creative and some people are like no i just want to hear the old songs yeah or i want to hear whatever they're going to do next that sounds kind of the same right i don't want them to change completely no it's it's the exact same thing and and as an artist that's part of our job i mean it's still it's still what we do and we're still we want to be paid for it and if you don't care you know, there, there are ways to work outside the gallery system. There's Instagram, there are pop-up shows, there are people who've done well, and there's increasing access to collectors. But as a gallerist, I could provide you, and I was a small gallery, I could provide you with a network of collectors, museums, writers, other people that you 
probably couldn't build over the course of your career mm, wow. unless you really want to do that, right? So part of what you're giving a gallery for outside of the space, the time, the health, the marketing, mm -hmm. uh, all the other stuff is their network. And we right. do that in any number of ways uh, with any number of businesses, right? Yeah. There's 100%. Great, yeah. And did you find when you were became in the position of more like in this bastardizing maybe, but as a gallery owner, like an agent, when you became more in that position of curating and looking at people's work, not, you know, for saleability and stuff like that, did that affect how you looked at your work? Oh, yeah, yeah. So two things. One, I worked with my, I generally worked with my artists to help them develop their work and their careers. So sometimes I would go into the studio and watch their process, or we would talk about things that weren't and weren't, weren't working. So we weren't just transactional. We helped people build their careers mm. uh, and, and develop their craft. The mm. work that I exhibited, I think that's important, particularly for young artists and students, the work that I exhibited and was reviewed, I was told in undergrad to put in a drawer and not show anyone. And as a grad student in the beginning of my grad uh, student career, uh, that it was awful. And that was the work that sold. Now I'm not saying, you know, just don't listen to your teachers because I was one of them, but, but I don't tell people their work is awful. I think, but you need to have faith in what you do. And you also need to take that feedback, need to trust it. Yes, uh, I became harder on myself in every fashion as I became uh, a gallerist and a curator and an educator, right? Because you're mm -hmm. critiquing work constantly. So you're hyper aware of everything. And that's, yeah, you turn that on yourself. I don't think you can help it. I'm probably like most of us would say at this level, my biggest critic. And, uh, mm -hmm. and part of continuing is balancing that with allowing your work to go out the door, right? You, you cannot let anything go because it's not perfect. Well, that's absurd too, right? It, when you're writing a book, at some point you need to realize nobody knows what's not in it. Right, the if, they don't, if they don't see it, they're not, yeah, no one knows that you haven't written that chapter because right. it's not there. And they'll be happy with what's there. So there's that too. You need to begin to balance um, what you do. I have a friend who's a painter who I think he sold two paintings. He loves them all so much. He just has a, a giant storehouse of them. I mean, a space, not a storehouse, but you know, storage space. Right. You know. That he keeps his own paintings. Yes, because he just loves them and they're like right. his kids and he can't give them up. Okay, oh, that's interesting. That's, fair. that's interesting. Yeah. Well, it is, it's sort of like, you know, it's very similar in the film businesses is you want to keep the essence of play and creativity and openness. And then it's called the film business, mm -hmm. not we're going to give you a bunch of money to do whatever you want all the time, right? Um, which we all wish would happen. And some select artists do get that. And, um, but it, that's not quite the norm. Well, the goal is to get your career to the point that people pay you to do what you love and what you're good at, right? I mean, that's really right. the goal as an artist or as a filmmaker or as mm -hmm. a creator or as yeah. a photographer or writer. You want people to pay you for your style and what you love to mm -hmm. do and enable you to do it with as much freedom as possible. And quite honestly, that's been my goal throughout my career and, and creativity and making has also enabled me to experience the world. So photography has been a vehicle in a lot of ways to owning a gallery or making an exhibition or traveling. And I think that's completely fair. I know other people who are just devoted to the craft, but it's, it's really enabled kind of a fun life. And I think that's important to remember as well. Yeah, you, you have to work towards that. Nobody gives that to you, by the way. You know, nobody says, right. work's amazing. We're just gonna fund what you wanna do forever. Um, very, <laughs> right. very, exactly. very rarely. <laughs> yeah. You, exactly. You have to, you sort of, it's not clawing for it, but you got to like, oh, you know, you got to work hard. Yeah. Go after it. And, and eventually, you know, and, it, and it's a really lovely to hear is, you know, especially when you're getting this sort of disparaging things from old professors is that you kept on, you know, like you kept going in the face of whatever came. And that's really a little, amazing. A little naive and obstinate. And uh, I didn't have a choice, you know, I mean, it's what right. I do, and it was it was hard for me not to do, in terms of art anyway, not to do what I am or what, kind of what just came out. Um, although there, I did certainly had a lot to learn in terms of making it better and understanding where it resided in the art world. You know, that's something different. Yeah, totally. I think you you have to though persevere. Rejection, you get humbled regularly, 
And mm. uh, that's just part of it. And you can either quit or not. That's just part of what we do. And I think it's important to know, I tell people if there are a thousand galleries and 994 of them or 96 of them hate your, hate your work, you'll have a great career. Because if four galleries <laughs> hate your work, you're killing it. So, you know, and there are a lot of reasons I didn't show work. It didn't fit my client base. It didn't fit with my other artists. Maybe personally, we didn't hit it off. You know, and that might not sound fair, but it's a really close relationship. So you want to have people that understand what you're doing and how you're doing it, how you do business, and then it needs to fit everything else. There's a lot of work I love that I just either didn't show or couldn't because maybe the gallery downstairs could, but I couldn't sell. They're just certain. I couldn't sell a portraiture, photographic portraiture, but Marvelli Gallery, a few floors down, it's all they did. I could never figure out how they mm. did it. Mm -hmm. I totally understand. So where can people find you if they want to, your Instagram, you know, follow your career? Sure. Get your antidote, um, antidotes. <laughs> my, my Instagram <laughs> is uh, Thomas Werner Projects. It's W-E-R-N-E-R -E -E Projects with an S. Uh, it's also my website. I, I have to say, because it's, I would be remiss if I didn't, that I wrote a book called The Fashion Image for Bloomsbury Publishing, and I have a book called The Business of Fine Art Photography coming out later this year with Rutledge Press. Those can, one can be found on Amazon and everywhere. The other one will be out. So please watch for that. I also write for IRC Magazine. It's a small, IRK Magazine. It's a small French fashion and culture magazine. It's a print and web publication. And uh, me and Julian, who run it, are have created uh, Le Loop, uh, Les Loops de Steps, a book publishing company. And they're launching their first book in Arles, France next week. And I'll be coming on board as the global editorial director. So helping people make books uh, globally. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. We're gonna, you know, in the coming months, we'll be talking more about that. Uh, and and then I, I run something called TWP Creative Edge. We, we help, uh, young creatives or we aspiring creatives, actually people at any point in their career who are trying to develop a body of work or understand how to market or brand or promote what they do. So we work with people to help refine their process or understand their process period. I think a lot of people are afraid, uh, you know, they don't take risks or they get lost in maybe the language of, you know, academia and they forget how to make. And we work with a lot of folks to help them kind of get on the path or achieve their success. And, and it's in fine art and fashion and photography. So it's been fun and grant writing and all that stuff too, writing as well. Uh, but writing and grant writing is a completely different process. Um, writing is- um, Thomas, tell us, tell us your website again, because this is where people can also access you for consultations or Thank that, you. you know, projects that you, you can help them out with. Yeah. What is it again? It's uh, both the Instagram and you can you can DM me there or on the website, Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, Werner, W-E-R-N-E-R, projects, P-R-O-J-E-C-T-S dot com. And there are links to things like this and other stuff on IG. So if you go there and you know, if it's not on Instagram, it doesn't exist. So <laughs> Exactly. Thank you so much. You're like a wealth of creativity and inspiration. And we're so happy that you came and talked with us today. Thank you, Liz. It's been an absolute pleasure. Wonderful. And thank you, New York Film Academy, for a great sponsoring of the 2020 series. And everybody have a wonderful 4th of July. And stay cool.